Bibles open there, and uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer as we draw near to Him now through, uh, through His Word. I want to respond to Him as He is, and it, it's my prayer that you would just see the Lord. Uh, you would uh, see the Lord Jesus and the treasure uh, that He is this morning. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, come before you, and, and Father, just uh, sense my utter dependence that anything good will be because of your work, by your spirit, through your word, and, and these dear folks being able to see you and see the Lord Jesus Christ in, in your glory, Lord. And, and Father, what grace, as we sang, what goodness is in, in you, Father, and that we might find our hearts just so satisfied in you that those around us can take notice and see that contentment, see that, uh, Father, rest in you, that you're our refuge, you're everything uh, to us. And Father, again, this is a work I, I know I can't manufacture or make happen, and I pray for it, Father, for your glory, for, for our good that you'd open our eyes just to see you, to see the Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 16, if you look at it there, a psalm of David begins with the words, Preserve me, O God. The psalm starts with this aching, desperate request. Think about those words, Preserve me, O God. We don't know the exact situation that David is in, but we can feel the desperation in those words, preserve me, oh God. It's rescue me, it's, it's keep me, it's, it's hold me, it's come and, and save me. They're the words you cry out when you're struggling for words, when you're struggling to breathe, heart pounding, struggling to know what to think and how to think. And sometimes it can be, simply from living in a fallen world. And we just feel overwhelmed in our souls. We feel it. It's a feeling of despair and fragility and wondering what's going to become of me and how can I survive life? Someone looking in from the outside may say, you have all this good going on in your life. There's no reason for despair, but for whatever reason, we feel dark and hopeless. We're crying out in our souls, from the depth of our souls, preserve me, O oh God. Or maybe it's a result of some circumstances in your life that you never wanted and never would have asked for that have been just pressed upon you. The phone call comes with news you would have never have expected and could never prepare for, or you had this plan for your life mapped out, and now this huge unwanted alteration to your plan has Come and you find yourself asking, what in the world is going on here? It's a question Jesse Morgan, a pastor at Green Pond Bible Chapel in New Jersey, was asking two weeks ago, June 1st. It was a long-awaited and much-needed sabbatical. Pastoring is hard, and it was a sabbatical for the, he, he, the start of it, and they had a lakeside trip as a family to Maine. And their six-year-old daughter, Lucy, <laughs> who they talked about was bubbling with energy, a fierce soccer player, and uh, the chief cuddler in the family always wanted to cuddle, said it was the best week of her life. And on their last full day at their rental cottage, they were having a quick lunch by the lake. Jesse said he had a book in his hand, and the kids were playing badminton, and their family vacation suddenly turned tragic when a shard of the badminton racket broke off and pierced their six-year-old daughter Lucy's skull, who was sitting on the sideline. And, and uh, little Lucy died four days after the shocking freak accident. Jesse describes in his blogs, and I encourage you to look up and read those, those blogs. I can help you find them or, or send them to you because they are rich with drawing near to God in great agony. They're full of the Psalms, by the way. He said the family made the 350-mile drive back to the New Jersey home without Lucy, her oldest, Lucy's oldest brother, asked, how can we ever be happy again? Jesse spoke of beating his chest at times, just asking God for faith. When they arrived at their home, they sat on the steps and cried until they could 
muster up the courage to open the door. And when they went inside, they all just collapsed on the kitchen floor and cried harder than ever before. This is preserve me, O oh God. What we want to do this morning here is to trace David's thoughts here in Psalm 16 to get into his heart. That's what we want to do in the Psalms, to follow his reasoning, to look at where he goes and what he sees in the midst of preserve me, O oh God. One author said, and this is so insightful, and this is kind of going to drive me for the whole summer of walking through the Psalms, for the people of God of every age and the full range of their life's experiences, the Psalms serve as prompts and patterns in drawing near to God. So insightful that we, the Psalms will serve as prompts and patterns in drawing near to God. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The big idea, if you want to, because I don't want you to miss it, the big idea of this Psalm, and probably you'll see the big idea of every Psalm that I share this summer is to draw near to God, <laughs> to draw near to God. You and I, we need to draw near to God. You and I need to draw near to God more. And the Psalms are here for us to step inside and let them become like vehicles. Vehicles take you somewhere, right? And, and the Psalms will be like vehicles for us and drawing near to God. They're here to help us draw near to God in our struggles and our fears and our pain and our times of desperation and darkness and joy. So as we walk through the Psalms this summer, each Psalm will be a prompt and a pattern to assist you and drawing near to God. I, I hope to lead my own heart this way, and your hearts, our hearts collectively, to draw near to God more. I hope for us to be a congregation who are actively drawing near to God. So as we follow David's thoughts here, what do we see? We want to see what David saw, to see how David draws near to God in the midst of his desperate request, preserve me, O oh God. So look, beginning in verse 1, he says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. And first, I know you don't have a study sheet today, but first point, David leads us here to draw near to God as your refuge. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. And that's what David is doing. Here David is actively turning to the Lord as his refuge. That's the psalm. He's not just saying this. He's, he's doing this. He's showing us the pattern for doing this. It's, it's what David is doing in the psalm. He's taking refuge. He's, he's drawing near. He's saying, I'm not turning to other places. You are my safest place. A, a refuge is a safe place in the midst of a fierce battle, a shelter in the midst of an awful storm, a place of rest, one weary and worn. And you just need a place to lay your head. And listen carefully, there is no refuge like the Lord. None. No other refuge can compare. I was thinking about that this week on a bike ride. <laughs> and I, I love my wife. I love Anne. Anne is definitely the better half of us by far. There's not even, not even close. <laughs> not even close. She is a wonderful, amazing wife. But if I can let you in on a little secret this morning, she's, she's, not, she's not perfect. I'm working on that for almost 40 years. It's hard work. Um, I'm working. I'm kidding. She's perfect for me. Uh, but the point I'm making is she can't be my refuge. Though there's times when I've tried to make her that. And I put way too much pressure on her if I try to make her my refuge. There is only one refuge in the storm. There's only one friend who is, sticks closer than a brother, as the scripture says, Jesus Christ. And it is amazing, it is amazing that we can have this secure, intimate relationship with the very God of the universe and that he can be our refuge, that he wants to be our refuge. That he says, draw near to me to be that refuge. That's Asaph's conclusion in Psalm 73, another wonderful psalm. Psalm 73, verse 28, he says, but as for me, it is good to be near God. It is good to draw near to God. What is the good life? This world will tell you all kinds of things about what the good life is. What is the good life? It's a life of drawing near to God. That's the good life. No matter what your circumstances. He says, but as for me, it's good to be near God. I made the Lord God my refuge. 
that I may tell of all your works. So first, draw near to God as your refuge, actively. That's what the psalmist Asaph is saying. I, I've made him my refuge. <laughs> I've drawn near to him as my refuge. I've rejected other refuges. I've drawn near to the Lord as my refuge. So first, draw near to God as your refuge. Secondly, David leads to draw near to God as your greatest treasure. Look at verse 2 of Psalm 16. And David says, I say to the Lord, notice it's all caps, Yahweh, uh, the God who, who commits himself to his people. Isn't that amazing? By covenant, he commits himself to his people. I say to the Lord, to Yahweh, you are my Lord, my Adonai. I have no good apart from you. I have no good apart from you. I have no good unless you're in it. David draws near to God knowing that there is good for him in God. The goodness of God woos him to draw near. All, all the good in his life is from God and in God. This is Psalm 23, 1, where David, the psalmist of Psalm 23, says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does David mean there in Psalm 23, 1, when he says, I shall not want? It means the sheep are just content, I shall not want. They're content, they're satisfied richly in the care of the shepherd. It is all my good is wrapped up in you. That's why I shall not want. Here's a question to think about. If people were to describe you, and maybe do this with somebody close to you here sometime this week, if people were to describe you with five to seven words, what would they say? What, what would be on that list? And here's the next question. How long would it be before the word contented, I shall not want, came up in that list? Would anyone use contented as one of the words to describe you? Would it come up if they used 15 to 20 words to describe you? Or would it come up if they used 20 to 30 words to describe you? Or 30 to 40 words? How important is it to be content? Well, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.6 6, that there's great gain in godliness with contentment. Now, you might think contented people, they're the people that are content because life has just gone right for them. You know, the circumstances have been good. They've been, they've been smooth. and No wonder they're content. But that's not what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4.11. Where he says to the church of Philippi, he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned. It's something he learned in whatever situation, in whatever situation. We think of all the situations Paul was in. I've learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and to abound and to be content in both situations. Paul's saying it is less a matter of the outward circumstances and it's more a matter of the heart, the inner person that they bring to those circumstances. And David in Psalm 16 is saying, I am content in the care of my shepherd Yahweh. He is my great treasure. All the good I have is in him. Here's what we're saying here. We're saying point to a person who is content, and we all want to be that person, is a person who's learned the skill of repeatedly finding refuge in God and repeatedly seeing him as your greatest treasure. You have to be active in going there. You find that person early in the morning or late in the evening with a regular time and place with their Bible on their lap, their prayer list in their hand, and they're quietly taking refuge in God. And they're exalting, exalting in who he is, counting their, their blessings of him <laughs> as their greatest treasure. John Piper, again, repeatedly says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That doesn't happen automatically with our, with our hearts. Our, our flesh fights against this. And David is directing his heart here. He's saying, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. He's directing his heart to see that all the good I have is wrapped up in you. David is speaking to his own soul as he exalts and declares who God is for him, even in the midst of the desperation of his request, preserve me, O God. Now, verses 3 and 4 are all connected to, to David's drawing near to God as his greatest treasure. Look at verse 3. As for the saints in the land, the fellow believers, fellow people of God, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. 
And, and it's beautiful that he leads us here because we want to live in community with others who are finding their refuge in Christ, who are seeking to find God as their greatest treasure. We, we, we need that. We're, we're trying to do Psalm 16 together, to do it together with others who are drawing near to God. Because every one of us daily get lured to find refuge in other things. The bait is out there, isn't it? They don't show the hook. Thomas Watson said here long ago, he said, Satan loves the fish in the troubled waters of a discontent heart. And isn't that true? Powerfully true. We need the encouragement of the body of Christ that together are doing Psalm 16 and seeking to find our satisfaction in Christ. In fact, I would love to see by the end of the summer, maybe August or early September, just a time where we come together in testimonies of, of God being our refuge, of God being our greatest treasure, and just satisfaction in, in Him. We, we need that. My small group, as we get together this summer at various times, this is where we're going to go they give you the heads up as encouraging each other and drawing near to God and finding refuge in Him and finding Him as our greatest treasure and how that's going and how we can encourage each other in that. We're never intended to live the Christian life as lone rangers. We're never intended to live the Christian life apart from the body of Christ. New Testament is plural. The letters are, are plural. One pastor said it this way, you never get a churchless Christ. You never get Jesus without his people. You don't just cuddle up to Jesus, me and Jesus, without his people. I have my visits and so many people that I visit say, I don't need the church, I don't need the church. And it might be because they didn't have a a, a real church, you know, with the gospel and the Holy Spirit there present in the, in the people. But my heart always sinks. No, you do. You do. <laughs> According to Jesus, Jesus says you do. Paul says in Colossians 1, 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. And he's saying they go together. They go together. James Boyce says here, this is a practical matter because the way you love the body of Christ is a way in which we can measure our love for the Lord. If you're unable right now to delight in God's people, all you see is all the, the negatives, ask God to do a work in your heart. To see the body the way Jesus sees it, who loves the body and gave himself for it. I mean, that drives me. I love this body of Christ because I love the Lord Jesus. He loves his body. Shed his blood for it. Then in verse 4, David says, The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offering of blood I'll not pour out or take their names on my lips. The pagan uh, religions would have this drink offering of blood. David says, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't even want to name it. David's saying, I will flee from every other refuge and I will turn from every other treasure. We want to find our contentment in Christ because of the profound sorrow that comes from seeking your contentment in any other source. And our world offers all kinds of alternative refuges, does it? Our, our hearts are prone to wander in the midst of that. And so there's self-medicating with drugs and alcohol abuse. There's illicit sex. There's endless material goods. There's living for the world's affirmation and applause or your accomplishments or your position or how you're regarded. Or there's trying to find refuge in the perfect spouse or the perfect job or the perfect house or the perfect relationships. And there's a warning in David's words here that there's real heartache and turning from the foundation of living waters, Jesus Christ, to find another God for refuge who will give you just multiplied sorrows. David knew firsthand, we've already seen that in 1 Samuel, we'll see it again when we go back to 1 Samuel in the fall, that there are real difficulties in following after the Lord. But the alternative, David says here, if you think following after the Lord is hard, <laughs> you think there's cost, and there is cost to following after the Lord, David says, see what sin brings you. Multiplied sorrows. This again is why we so need others around us who are seeking to find their satisfaction in the Lord, who are drawing near to him as their refuge and their, and their greatest treasures. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you, are you learning to be satisfied in God? Are you praying for that, asking for that, longing to draw near to him as your greatest treasure. 
In verse 5, David says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Picture a, a table spread out in front of David with everything the world offers to fill you up, <laughs> to quench your thirst and your appetite. David says, I look at all that spread and I choose the Lord. He's my portion and my cup. The Hebrew literally says, the Lord is the portion of my portion. David saying, this is what he's saying. I, if I sum it up, three words, I have him. <laughs> I have him. This is, I am his, and, and he is mine. People often on my visits will say their prayer is for peace. They just, you know, the turmoil of facing death and not knowing when and end of, being at the end of life and plans interrupted. And it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult, it can be a very, very dark time. People are about a cloud of darkness just descending. And, 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 I, and I share whenever I have opportunity, there's no greater peace than to be able to say, I am his and he is mine. I have him. <laughs> that he is me. He sustains me and refreshes me and he gives himself to me and I am so satisfied in him. One of the marks of our present world and the times in which we live is a real sense of discontentment. It's in the air. It's in the water. We're, we're a generation with short attention spans and restless spirits. And we're, we're never quite satisfied. We somehow want to be entertained by something. And, and David says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. They're, they're, they're words of contentment. They're words that speak powerfully of a heart just filled with contentment. We can have that. <laughs> we can have that. And then David says, verse 5 and 6 there, you hold my lot. The lines, for me have fa the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. And David is using the language of measuring lines, the you know, way people would plot out property. And, and David is saying the Lord is sovereign over the lines of my life. He's sovereign over the circumstances of my life. And he's satisfied knowing that even in the midst of the circumstances, whatever they are, that are driving him to say, preserve me, O oh God. They're driving him to find refuge in God. He's saying the border lines you have defined for me push me to draw near to you. And I'm satisfied in drawing near to you. See, since God holds my lot, the greatest thing he does for me by his sovereignty is he allows circumstances at times that drives me to draw near to him as my refuge and my greatest treasure. Because that's the good. That's the good. Sometimes the way the lines have fallen are painful, aren't they? You know that. You've shared with me. You may wish you could choose different circumstances. Oh, I wish I could choose different circumstances circumstances. We have people here wading through incredibly deep water. I like what John Piper says here. He said, occasionally weep deeply over the life you hoped it would be. Isn't that incredible? Grieve the losses. Then at some point, wash your face and trust God and embrace the life you have. That's David, the lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. To do that, you have to believe that the good life is to be near God. <laughs> the good life is not the perfect spouse, perfect house, perfect retirement, perfect. The good life is to be near God, whatever the circumstances. The greatest good for you is to draw near to God. And perhaps with different circumstances, you would not be drawing near to him. Asaph again, but for me it's good to be near God. And he was saying that in tough circumstances himself. I've made him my refuse that I may tell of all your works. The good life is to draw near to him in the midst of whatever circumstances you're in. Point number three, David shows what that David shows us is to draw near to God as your sovereign king. The good life is not having everything you wanted. It's about having God, even in the midst, perhaps, of having nothing you wanted. <laughs> Let me say that again. The good life is not having everything you wanted. It's about having God, even in the midst of nothing you wanted. And hear this. This side of eternity 
is our only chance to worship Jesus through tears and pain and suffering. Because in heaven, all our tears will be wiped away. <laughs> no more pain, no more sorrow. This side of heaven, we can worship him even in the midst of preserve me, O God. This side of heaven, we can declare his glory by showing how satisfied we are in him even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. And when you show your satisfaction in Jesus in the midst of tears, how oh, it powerfully points to him. It powerfully. It's a, it's a megaphone saying, look at Jesus. Look at how good he is. Look at what he does. So again, point number three, draw near to God as your sovereign king. Now David goes on in verse seven to say this. He says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. We think back to Psalm 1 where we were a couple weeks ago where the psalmist says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, um, but his delight, his, his delight. He, he finds joy in the law, in the, in the word of God, in the law of the Lord, and on his law, on the word. He meditates day and night. Or Psalm 119, 24, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. They are. They are. You want the greatest counselor you can find? They are. He is. David is delighting in the Lord's counsel. And in the night when he awakes, the things weighing on his heart, perhaps keeping him awake. You and I have been there. He continues to chew on that counsel. And when you don't have that, when you don't have the Lord's counsel, we're going to see this fall, 1 Samuel 26, when King Saul is in a desperate situation in the greatest crisis of his life, and God is silent. There's no direction. No counsel. Saul is cut off. And the silence is utterly terrifying. David, on the other hand, here in Psalm 16, he leads us, number four, to draw near to God as your trusted counselor. God is a refuge in part by the way he counsels us. But God being a refuge for you and by his counsel is not automatic <clears throat> if you, um, you know, leave your Bible all week, <laughs> you know, off to the side, you know, it's not that we pay little attention to his word or next to no attention to his word and then simply have him as our refuge, as your trusted counselor. Uh, we need to be active in drawing near to hear the counsel in his word. Larry Crabb, after losing his brother in a tragic airplane crash, said this, just being honest, he said, I cried out to God, I know you're all I have, but I don't know you well enough for you to be all that I need. Is that honest? <laughs> and so true, but not where we want to be. You know, we want to be now and every day and when life's full of joy, but when, when the crisis comes, we want to know him the way David is describing here. We want to follow David's lead here to draw near to God as our trusted counselor, to know him and his ways through his counsel, through drawing near to him. <clears throat> now there's a powerful flow of worship that happens in the psalm as David draws near to the Lord. Look at verse 8 there. Look at verse 8. David says, <clears throat> I have set the Lord always before me, and because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. You see what's happened in this flow as we just follow David's thoughts and see what he saw? This is not a request anymore. <laughs> this is not desperation here. David is exalting here. He's worshiping in all that God is for him as his refuge, as his treasure, and his sovereign king, and his counselor. This is a conscious effort on David's part. I've set the Lord always before me. That's what he's doing, verses 1 to 7. That's drawing near to the Lord. Drawing near to the Lord is setting the Lord before you. That's, that's drawing near to him. And the result there is this unmovable stability, even amidst of whatever trial had led to David's initial request. And the result here is red-hot worship. <laughs> red-hot worship. Verse 8 again, I've set the Lord always before me, and because he's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. I, I shall not be 
moved. And again, in the midst of preserve me, O God, we can follow David's prompt and pattern to draw near to God, to exalt in all that he is for you as your refuge and your treasure and your sovereign king and your trusted counselor and to move towards red hot worship even in the midst of whatever desperation and agony. Now here's where I wrestled with dividing this message in two at about 11.30 last night. <laughs> I thought, there's so much more here. It could be a whole other sermon. But I decided that I at least want to give you a snapshot of verses 9 to 11. I don't want to leave it. So I'm going to be going in snapshot form what really I could take um, much more time to unpack. Look at verse 9. Therefore, <clears throat> David says, because of the truth of verses 1 to 8, because of verses 1 to 8, because of drawing near to God there and exalting in all that he is for David in verses 1 to 8, therefore my heart is glad, my whole being <clears throat> rejoices. Rejoices in what? In him. <coughs> rejoices in him. My flesh also dwells secure, for you'll not abandon my soul to Sheol. Sheol is simply the place of the dead, the, the grave. Or let your Holy One see corruption. David, the <clears throat> first part of verse 10 says, for you'll not abandon my soul to Sheol, to the grave. Perhaps the circumstances in which David led David to cry out, preserve me, O God, was because his life was in jeopardy. And David is not saying here that he would never die, but he is saying that Yahweh, the Lord, will never abandon him there. This is Psalm 23, 6. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Literally, your goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. So when we sing that uh, song of the month, your goodness is running after me. That's what that's what. The psalmist is saying, David is saying there in Psalm 23, your goodness and mercy will pursue me, will run after me, <laughs> will pursue me. Oh, so thankful that, that our Lord is like that. And then he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He knew, David knew that he would be with the Lord. His soul would be with the Lord. So what about the second part, verse 10? Or let your Holy One see corruption. Well, David did die eventually, we know, and was buried, and his body did see corruption. So what is the second part of verse 10 telling us? His soul was with the Lord, but his body saw corruption. It's interesting, and again, don't have time to take as much time as I should here, but there's 11 first-person phrases there where he's saying, you are my Lord, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. And then there's this, this distinction in the second part of this verse 10 where it goes to the second person there where he says, or let your Holy One see corruption. That's interesting. So what does the second part of verse 10 tells us? Well, Peter, and, and Paul as well in the New Testament, Peter in Acts 2, he answers that question in his sermon, <clears throat> his powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, beginning in verse 29. Peter says this in his sermon. <clears throat> he says, Brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. His body is in the tomb. His body saw corruption. Being therefore a prophet, where was David a prophet? We'll hear Psalm 16, as we'll see. And, and knowing that God had sworn an oath, a, a covenant, made a covenant with David to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne. Well, that is second. Samuel 7, verse 12, where God tells David that he would lie with his fathers, he would die, but that God would raise up an offspring to be on his throne, the Messiah, who would have an everlasting kingdom, <laughs> who, who, who death could not conquer. A Messiah would have an everlasting kingdom. He, that is David, foresaw, and listen to what Peter says so insightfully, spoke about the resurrection of, of the Christ. When? Psalm 16, verse 10. 
that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Psalm 16, verse 10, that Peter quotes there. This Jesus, Peter then says, God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. <laughs> so powerful. 3,000 come to Christ on that day. The church was powerfully uh, born there. Peter powerfully says that Psalm 16.10 goes beyond what is true for David to a greater David. In a greater sense, Jesus Christ fulfilled the promise of Psalm 16.10 with his resurrection. And what does all that mean? Well, it means that when you turn from sin to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only is he your refuge and treasure and sovereign king and trusted counselor now, but he will be that for you forever <laughs> because Jesus, by his death and resurrection, makes all that possible. And because he rose, you will rise, and Jesus' sheep will be forever satisfied in the care of their shepherd. For Revel the book of Revelation says, a lamb, the Lord Jesus at the center of the throne, will be their shepherd and will lead them to springs of living water. It's just full satisfaction. Psalm 23, in his presence forever and eternity. I stood in a cemetery in Clarence yesterday, beautiful morning, um, just in the cool of the morning, uh, beautiful trees, the birds, chirping. I was waiting for the family to gather. The military was already there. The bagpiper was there. And my thoughts were on this psalm. And as I looked at the many tombstones there and all, you know, shapes and varieties, some very, very old. And I looked at the dates, you know, and the dash between the, uh, uh, between the dates, different lifespans. And here's the thought that came to my mind. That because Jesus walked out of that tomb, the Holy One did not see corruption. <laughs> Those who trusted Christ in this life, they're with their shepherd, and they are so satisfied <laughs> in his presence, fullness of joy. They are so, so satisfied, and their bodies, this is a resurrection site, when Jesus returns, we'll be caught up together with him, with those who've gone before in the clouds. What difference does it make? We'll just ask Jesse Morgan the pastor who lost his little girl, Lucy, whose funeral was yesterday, he blogged this. And again, I really encourage you to look up those blogs, just how he finds refuge in Christ and in the Psalms, in the agony. And he blogged this. He said, four weeks ago, Lucy asked Bethany, Bethany would be his wife, Lucy's mom, how to be with God and be saved. And always independent, she then went to her room and prayed to God for forgiveness and that she believed in Jesus' death and resurrection for her, for her, for her salvation. What a gift, Jesse said. What a gift. She loved to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast, in her family devotions, Lucy journaled her love for Jesus. As a, as a six-year-old, I think you'll see some examples, a couple of examples from her from her journals, and uh, if I can just say here as an aside, <laughs> moms and dads, teach your children to draw near to God. Teach them, model it, model it, lead them, use the summer as an opportunity, use the Psalms journals that we have available for you as an opportunity, teach them to draw near what it is to draw near to the Lord. It will matter little if your child becomes a famous astronaut <laughs> and yet doesn't love Christ. Teach them to draw near to the Lord. I'm thankful my dad, dad is here, my mom is here, and I remember in the midst of trial in their life, the steel plant closing down, out of work, and uh, kids in college, how are we, we going to pay these, these bills? And just remember sitting around the uh, campfire, uh, camping, and them just reveling. And how great a refuge. How great a refuge the Lord was for them. How satisfied they were in him as their greatest treasure. You remember that as a kid. You don't forget. The 
You don't forget because it's real. It's authentic. It's from the heart. It's the result of drawing near to God. Jesse, the pastor there from New Jersey, he blogged last Sunday, he blogged this. What difference does the resurrection make? Today is resurrection day, he blogged. The day the church gathers to proclaim that Jesus is risen and that he dealt death a death blow. And this changes everything, doesn't it? And because he lives... <laughs> It changes everything because we can draw near to him because he lives. Verse 11, David says, You have made known to me the path of life. That's a path right now. That's a path of drawing near to God. It's the good life. The good life is drawing near to God. It's a, it's a path of life. You've made known to that in your presence that's now and that's going to be forever. There's fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures, happinesses forevermore. Praise God. I'm going to pray, and then uh, there's a group, Shane and Shane, and what they're, I don't know if they've got all 150 yet, but they're endeavoring to uh, write a song with every one of the psalms. And so we're just going to have their song played here, Psalm 16, their song. And as they do, just reflect on where might you draw near to God? Uh, maybe they draw near to him as your refuge, or draw near to him as your sovereign king, draw near to him as your greatest treasure. Draw near to him as your trusted counselor. Where might you draw near to God? Let me pray, and then we'll have this uh, song on, on video. Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for all that you are to us through Christ, in Christ. Father, uh, nothing we deserve, nothing we can earn. Uh, Father, it's by your grace. It's out of your goodness. You're so generous. We have you. If we belong to Jesus Christ, if he's our Savior, we, we belong to you, Father. And to be able to say, I am his and he is mine. There's no greater blessing, no greater privilege, no greater peace than that. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the storm swirling around, we have a refuge in Christ Jesus. And we just praise you for that with all our hearts. We thank you for who you are. We love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.